our um, first cafe break of the semester. This is our monthly series. Um, where we bring in people from the area to um, present research and work in progress. And uh, you have in front of you our flyer for the semester. You can take this with you. Our next uh, cafe break is going to be on March 27th. They're always on Wednesdays at this time. Um, and we're going to have the curator for Latino art from the National Museum of American Art. So she is going to be talking about some of her experiences curating and exhibiting Latino art in um, the United States. So we're very pleased today to have with us Professor um, Michelle Espino, who uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Counseling, Higher Education, and Special Education in the uh, College of Education here at the University of Maryland. And she just arrived at the university this past September, so this is our first chance to hear uh, about her work. And um, prior to coming to the University of Maryland, she was um, an assistant professor at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. She says she likes DC better. <laughs> <laughs> Her PhD is uh, from the University of Arizona in higher education. She received that in 2008. Um, and she has published on Latino and Latina educational pathways. Um, looking at structures, mechanisms, programs, and uh, actors involved in access to graduate school and retention in graduate school, especially for underrepresented uh, population. And she's interested in critical methodologies in uh, research in higher education. She's published in a number of different um, venues, including the Review of Higher Education, um, Equity and L. Excellence in Education um, on, on these topics, as well as a number of book reviews and book articles. So we're really happy to have her here to present her work. And over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for taking time um, out of your day to come in and hear some of the work that I am doing. Um, I'm really excited when I was invited, and thanks so much to the American Study Center for even having come through break as an opportunity to showcase um, some work. Um, this is something, an aspect out of my dissertation research. Um, I looked at 33 Mexican American PhDs and their life narratives um, all the way through the PhD. And, um, and so this is a, a piece that I, what I would love to do is uh, certainly get uh, your feedback um, and then my hope is to submit this for a journal publication. So, um, so this is kind of just some uh, thoughts that I have about the women particularly in my study that I have. Um, I wasn't really sure uh, who all would be attending uh, this session, and so I just wanted to give a very brief overview about um, specifically the study of higher education, because often people will ask me, well, I didn't even know you could study higher ed um, or college students, and that is pretty much what I do. Um, and there's two different ways of looking at higher education. Uh, one of them is uh, to focus on kind of higher ed as a system um, and as a structure in our greater society and how various factors will affect the way that a, a university as an organization will behave. So um, particularly for Research One universities, there's always this uh, push to become more prestigious um, and along with that increase the number of faculty who are doing entrepreneurial work, so bringing money back to the university. So what are the implications of that on a larger scale um, for faculty and for the universities as they're trying to get more prestige? So some examples of the type of work that can be done there would be at the federal level investigating, for example, the, um, the current Supreme Court case, uh, Fisher versus University of Texas, it was an affirmative action. That certainly will have implications for how we admit our students and create diverse campus communities. Um, so some of my uh, colleagues study that aspect um, of legal issues. Another example, um, I have uh, colleagues who look at athletics, and particularly this move of, uh, for Maryland going from the ACC to the Big Ten Conference has some implications not only for athletics, but also revenue generation um, and, and research opportunities um, at places like the University of Michigan and Ohio State. So there's implications for doing that. And then finally, at the state level, which is of particular interest to me, is how, do, um, how does like, the state system of Maryland and community colleges in the state uh, prepare for uh, implementing the DREAM Act policy that was passed here in the state. And so what kind of policies and procedures are they creating? What kind of structures 
um, are they making at all to support students without documentation who now supposedly have access um, and in-state tuition rates to be able to come to college. Um, so those are some kind of larger systemic issues that higher ed looks at. We also look at the individual and how individuals experience college life. So we study students, and particularly between the ages of 18 and 24 is our main focus. Um, and, and part of that is because many of these students are still at um, kind of moving out of adolescence and still in kind of post-adolescent stages. And so what are the ways in which cognitive development occurs, psychosocial development, moral and ethical development, and identity development occurs on a college campus? And what kind of interventions can we create? What kind of programs and support systems can we develop so that students can develop into these global citizens that we claim we create um, out of our universities? And then we also look at faculty. And an example here would be the advanced grant. Um, which not only supports women in the STEM fields, but really here at Maryland is targeting women, faculty, and all the colleges to ensure that they are finding ways to achieve tenure, um, because that certainly is a problem um, that we experience nationwide. Um, administrators are also studied, um, not only the administrators that work directly with students, but the administrators who are working on behalf of faculty, who now are having to contend with grants and money making, um, intellectual property issues, um, maintaining laboratories. So there's been this huge increase in the number of administrators on a college campus. And so, um, so no one's really looking at their experiences particularly. And then finally, we have some colleagues who are looking at alumni and the ways in which certain identity groups um, give more to their campus um, in, in terms of philanthropy, right, and to raising money with endowments. So there's all kinds of ways to look at college life from both the individual level and from the institutional level. And for me, I kind of try to do both. Um, I try to look at how these larger structures and systems and policies inevitably affect students and their families, uh, and particularly Latino students in this case. So that's kind of like the academic reason why I do my work, but <coughs> the real reason I do this work is because of my family. I'm a first-generation college student from El Paso, Texas, and um, I continue to want to understand how did I, as a first-generation college student, the first in my family to go to college, manage to, in what may have been described as a traditional Mexican family, right? how did I manage to move away from that and go to college 500 miles away, still in the great state of Texas, let me say that, um, <laughs> but to an undergrad in, in, in uh, San Antonio? How did that happen for me? Um, and not for my sister, who is only two years younger, who has yet to go to college. Um, and certainly we can talk about, oh, there must be some individual reasons, like, you must be really smart, or you could really navigate through, you know, education. Well, it's more than that, right? We know that children from a very young age are tracked um, into lines of, of production, right? So either labor production, so taking a vocational track, or knowledge production and going on to college. That happens as early as fourth and sixth grade. So oftentimes, even if a student is smart, right, once they get tracked, it's very hard to, to jump tracks, right? Um, and certainly being able to access schools that have um, curriculum that is inclusive of communities of color. Um, so it isn't just about the individual. It really is about the individual, the family, the community, um, the types of schools that are available to them and, and the resources that they're able to access. Uh, and then the opportunities that are presented to students to be able to access higher education. Um, so this is a picture of, uh, this is me in my defense. I had 25 people at my dissertation defense because I said, it takes a village, it takes a village. <laughs> so my parents went, and those are all the <laughs> copies of the dissertation that I had to uh, work through with all the revisions. Um, but that's my family, and then my niece, um, was six at the time that I graduated. And it's one of my most treasured photos because it reminds me that the work that I do, and often uh, for people who are really passionate about a particular field, and for me it's about Latino education, that it isn't just about me, right? It's about creating the pathway for others, um, helping someone to craft their own pathway uh, to higher education. And so that's, that's something that really drives me. So certainly I can cite for you all the academic stuff, but in the end, what keeps me going, even in these cold, wintry days, <laughs> is, you know, 
the sense of family and, and just trying to resolve a question that I probably will never be able to fully answer, right? So let me share with you a little bit about just kind of what the pipeline looks like for particularly Mexican-American children. Um, and certainly, um, there's been some work that's been done to disaggregate uh, the Latino community by not just Mexican, but uh, by Cuban, Puerto Rican, um, South American, um, and so certainly we can talk about that. But in general, if you look at 100 elementary school students, 47 of those will graduate from high school. 56 will either stop out or, or be forced to leave or drop out right, from high school. Out of that 47, 26 will have the opportunity to enroll in some type of college. And a majority of them will inevitably be um, siphoned into second, uh, two-year institutions, like community colleges. Um, and then about nine of them will end up going to a four-year institution. Out of that group, um, only seven will actually finish their college degree. Uh, and then from there, two will graduate with a some type of professional degree, like a JD um, or a, an MBA. And then less than one will actually graduate with a doctorate. Um, so, so there's certainly some issues, certainly down here, with trying to increase the number of Mexican Americans who are obtaining doctoral degrees. But we also have this huge problem, um, even trying to get folks to graduate from high school. So there's some some problems that are happening all along the pipeline that folks are studying. And so for me, I'm really interested in kind of how does someone actually successfully graduate from high school and then move on down through college, succeed in, in what I perceive to be very hostile, racist, sexist environments, and then still manage to want to persevere to go on to graduate school. So to give you kind of the, the review of the literature um, and things that I've just kind of picked up on, so, you know, when we look at that pipeline uh, graph, you know, we often see that, well, there's low rates of educational attainment, and who's to blame? So people want to, to blame people, and who they tend to blame are the families themselves, and the Latino community itself, the culture itself. Um, so certainly there are discriminatory educational policies that date back even to the early 1900s, when Mexican children were segregated out west. Um, from white schools uh, and into Mexico, were put into Mexican schools. There were also, um, and usually that was done only by surname, uh, not even if students knew Spanish or not. Um, and also by phenotype, so the skin color, um, the darker the, the child, um, the more likely they were going to be placed into a Mexican school or into a black school. Um, and then also Americanization programs um, that really focused on the, these hygiene programs. Um, so, you know, the whole image of the dirty Mexican was pretty prevalent during that time, and so children would be inspected for their hygiene, Mexican children, um, while they went to school, and then um, asked to shower in the event that they were deemed dirty, right? So this whole, like, image of the dirty Mexican um, was really prevalent even in educational practice. Um, and then certainly once people are able to kind of deal with these discriminatory educational policies that still are prevalent today, um, when they go to graduate school, there are, are challenges that they face in terms of program selectivity. So certain, you know, certain programs only want to accept a certain number, right, to en enhance their prestige, to be able to say, we had 100 people apply for our graduate program, but we're only choosing two, right? Um, there's also an issue of once you get into graduate school, the types of socialization processes that occur that often focus on much more on competition rather than collaboration. Um, and um, kind of individualize the experience rather than build community. Uh, and then also time to degree, that it takes longer for students in the social behavioral sciences to graduate than even those in the sciences. And part of that is because the sciences, um, a majority of graduate assistantships are focused on laboratory work um, and being able to complete uh, certain experiments, right? With social behavioral sciences, there isn't a funding mechanism generally, and so students are always trying to hustle to try to get money um, to be able to pay for college and, or for graduate school. So often they end up teaching, and teaching takes time away from doing research. Um, so there's some, uh, some discussions about that. There's also discussions about the fact that a lot of our educational research, unfortunately, still focuses on deficit models. So it's everything that communities lack. They don't value education, um, they speak Spanish at the home, their um, cultural traditions are deficient, 
Um, and so if only they could become more American um, or assimilate, that they would be more successful, right? Uh, and then this is very apparent in subtractive schooling, the concept of subtractive schooling, where uh, schools in K-12 education really work to subtract culture, right? Um, and uh, rather than helping a student to recognize his or her cultural background um, and to, to, you know, be empowered by that. There is some work um, to try to offset that on asset-based models. So um, looking at how even though parents may lack the knowledge to go to college, that there's still their aspirations and their hopes and dreams are still a sense of capital that students can use as they try to access college and graduate school. That students are resilient, that there are ways in which from within you're able to survive these hostile environments. Um, as long as we create campus communities that where you find a sense of belonging. So it might be a cultural center or a particular student organization that uh, means something to you that's connected to your culture and your identity. And finally, there's um, a variety of different models. So funds of knowledge is one of these models, community cultural wealth, pedagogies of the home. These are all looking at the assets that families provide within the home to help a, a child be able to succeed in education. Um, and specific to this research that I'm interested in, um, I really am, am thinking about writing this in some ways as a response to this new phenomenon that's been happening in the literature. And it is about this vanishing Latino male. There's been a lot of work in the, in the past few years about black male initiatives and Latino male initiatives. Um, and, and basically the narrative around that is that there aren't a lot of Latinos and black men in college, and so we need to figure out how to ensure, right, because there is a, a real issue of the school-to-prison pipeline uh, that is inev inevitably moving black men in particular into prison, right? into the prison system. Um, and Latino males would be similar. Um, but I think what has happened, unfortunately, is that is where the money is going in terms of educational research, right, to just the Latino males. And, and my argument is that there are some challenges that Latino women are experiencing that is not being addressed. Um, and so in many respects, colleges are doing a disservice to Latinas thinking that, in some ways, like, oh, they're fine. We don't really need to address their concerns. And I think the similar uh, stance could be taken about black women. So finally, just to give you specifically about Latino PhDs, 28% um, of all graduate students are students of color. And that's OK, I guess. I mean, that's not a really big number, right? And out of that, only 8% are Latino, Latina total. Um, and then they're going to go into particular disciplines that we would normally, we would assume we would find them, right? So a majority of Latinos are going to end up going into education and business, um, which are much more kind of practice oriented. Um, and certainly with families, especially as first generation students, they don't know of other types of professions necessarily. And so they know they can be a teacher, they know they can be a doctor or a lawyer, those kinds of things, or a business person. Um, and only 13% are actually enrolled in engineering, physical sciences, biological sciences. So there's something happening where we're not mentoring students to aspire into those uh, areas either. When you look at the women, 66% um, of, of all the graduate students of color are women. Um, and 64% of that number are Latinas, um, which is really interesting. But I, I think if we were to actually look at the raw numbers, <laughs> it wouldn't seem so fantastic. Um, but we also know that regardless, um, race, ethnicity, gender, that there really is a 50% chance that those who enter a doctoral program will not finish. Uh, and so some of that, again, is attributed to uh, the types of socialization processes that, that they experience, the amount of time that it takes for them to finish. Um, and so often what happens is, and universities are not doing a good job at all of tracking graduate students. We cannot tell you why people leave or stop out. Um, there's no explanation for what happens with this attrition. And part of that is this narrative that, well, it's survival of the fittest, right? So you just couldn't cut it. And so that's why you're gone, right? This kind of, this type of mentality often happens with this, uh, with the faculty. And, um, and along with that, students will blame themselves rather than necessarily the, the program that they were in, right? Or the environment, the hostile environment that they may have experienced. All right, 
Yeah, so are there any questions about that kind of literature? We can talk more after that. So when I was thinking about the types of theories I wanted to, to see my data through, so often when you're using theory, it's kind of like you're putting on some sunglasses and you're looking through them to try to understand, um, kind of decode some of the, the interviews. And all of my um, data was based on interviews. Um, so there's three different kind of areas that I wanted to uh, make sure that I attended to. And one of them certainly is critical race theory and Latino critical race theory. And, um, and these started originally from the legal profession, um, really looking at this kind of notion that the um, judicial system was supposedly objective, right? But for some reason, we still continue to have more people of color going to prison. Um, and so there's something going on there where it's not just about being objective or neutral. Um, and then that was adopted and incorporated into education. And so, um, so what basically uh, CRT in education looks at is, you know, it draws from a variety of disciplines. It centers race and racism um, rather than just kind of making it a kind of a, a like an add-on. Um, it becomes the center of someone's analysis. Um, it's also about social justice. So what can we do to, now we know the data, what are we going to do with it? Um, so that's the, the approach that Black Crit often takes. Black Crit also looks at immigrant status, phenotype, language acquisition, accent, um, as ways to also explain the experiences that people, uh, Latino people are, are experiencing. Um, along with that, I also want to look at Chicano feminism because uh, I thought it was important to look at issues of race, class, and gender within my dissertation. And, um, and so Chicano feminism, for me, I really attends to the challenges of fragmentation that Latinas experience in higher education, um, and particularly uh, faculty experience, right? This, this kind of pulling apart um, that women are really torn asunder as they experience academe. And so what are we doing to try to help bring some wholeness to lived experience, mind, body, spirit, as Lada says. Um, and along with that, the development now in particular looks at Chicana feminist epistemology, and it's just the ways in which we know, our ways of knowing, and using our cultural intu uh, intuition as Latinas to be able to help us to analyze data. Um, and so along with that, recognizing that, that our lived experiences and our identities are part of a brain. Right? So we can't necessarily just talk about race. We have to talk about race intertwined with gender. We have to talk about race intertwined with, intertwined with gender and class and sexual orientation. All of these make up who we are in our identities. So we can't just pull them apart. So the larger questions that I had um, were about just how these 33 Mexican-American PhDs were experiencing issues of racism, classism, and sexism along their journeys to the doctorate. The ways in which they were maybe resilient, maybe not. Um, the ways in which they reproduced some of the stereotypes about the community uh, or resisted them. Um, what kind of support mechanisms did they use with their families, with their communities, with their faculty to be able to survive? And how do they still navigate these different worlds? Because I really felt that they were going from the world of their families and their communities to also the world here on campus. Um, and so what I did was I interviewed, and I have about 100 hours of interviews with these um, PhDs. And so I used narrative analysis to try to analyze the story that they were sharing with me, how they made meaning out of that story, um, and really taking a critical look at at the ways in which they made meaning of dealing with racism, sexism, and classism. Knowing that, uh, and CRT really helps us understand that your experience, your experience gives you knowledge and that knowledge should be valid. Um, and often it isn't um, often valid in research um, and it certainly isn't valid on our college campus. So to recognize that these are truths that people hold with them. Um, and that even if they are partial truths, because there are memories, right? We don't uh, we don't have absolute truth. That they're still important. They're still real to that person, and how that person experienced an issue uh, regarding oppression. Okay. So here are my women participants. So out of the 33, 25 of them identified as being of Mexican descent. I had three who were biracial. And I had um, three who were from New Mexico whose families were, they could trace back their families seven generations. 
Um, so I had people who had just moved to the country um, from Mexico and went from Canada. Um, I had people who were third generation Mexican American uh, college students and people who were first generation. So what I was really intrigued by was, you know, there's all this narrative of Latinos are only first generation, they all speak Spanish, they're all from the West Coast. And the reality is that, that they're not, right? They're a very complex community, um, very diverse community. And so I wanted to make sure I attended to that. Um, and as it turned out, 12 in my study, I asked, I asked them how they identified in terms of their social class growing up. And they 12, 12 of them identified as working class or poor, and 12 identified as middle class. And one, and that doesn't add up to 25, I don't know. <laughs> um, one of them, uh, I never finished her interview, so I was never able to gather that information. Um, but I, I didn't really ask any more about, like, well, what do you mean by middle class? But this is how they chose to identify. Most of them, as we would have suspected, are in social behavioral sciences and education, although I was really excited that I had four people in the sciences um, who were researchers and two in the humanities. Most of them were faculty, uh, researchers or analysts, and then four of them were administrators in some type of K-12 or college. Okay. So, these are kind of based on the experiences that they shared with me. There are some interesting findings that I, I would like to share with you and see what your thoughts are about this. So one of the major findings was that education was deemed as liberation from men, but not necessarily from traditional family constructs. Um, and for a lot of the women who were working class and poor, the consejos or advice that they received from their families, um, particularly from their mothers, were based on their mother's concerns that, um, that, that basically their mothers were denied educational opportunities as young people, right? And could not escape troubled marriages and relationships because of their levels of educational attainment. And so that inevitably affected their ability to be free, right? Um, and so often the consejos that they gave to their daughters was, you need to get, you know, uh, in case he leaves you, you need to have education so that you can have a fair income and take care of your children. So this was a, a very big reason why many of them were encouraged to go to college. Um, along with that, so this was a message from poor and um, working class uh, families. From those families where mothers had college degrees, the consejos were connected with preserving some Mexican traditions and presenting a positive family image within Mexican American communities and the greater society. So often, even though the mothers may have had a college degree, many of them were the primary caregivers and stayed at home. Um, and part of that was because either uh, the father's salaries allowed for that to happen, right? Um, or that they were very concerned that they would be socially criticized, particularly the fathers were concerned. Um, and so, as Fernanda explains here, um, she's middle class, Mexican, second generation college student, um, her father is like saying, well, what are these people going to say if they find out that the wife of Dr. Cervantes is working? And so there was this, this message. So what was really interesting to Fernanda was that even though her mother was being discouraged from working, right, that her father was still encouraging her um, to go on to go to college. So she, she received a lot of conflicting messages in both the practice of her father demanding that food be ready, you know, on the dinner table when he got home, but then also telling her to go get an education, right? Um, so, that, so that was an interesting uh, experience that, that she was, that she had. Um, and certainly that her mother uh, and different mothers within these participants' uh, experiences were always constantly telling them that they could not depend on anybody but themselves. Um, but I would like to say that within the participant list, um, as I was going through their stories, that it wasn't just about the mothers encouraging or the fathers discouraging uh, the women to go on to college. Many of the men actually were trying to encourage their daughters to go on to college. Um, and so, but what, what I ended up finding was that liberating oneself from a man did not equate to independence from the family unit, which leads to education being a double-edged sword. So, so many of the participants experienced uh, 
were encouraged to go to college, and part of that was, right, so that in case he doesn't leave you. So it's a very heteronormative, heterosexist kind of um, advice that they were receiving. Because there wasn't ever any discussion of any other type of sexual orientation, right? Um, and so, so many of them were being pushed into, um, after college, to say, well, why do you want to be more educated? Like, you're going to educate yourself out of the market. And so, as an example of that, uh, Monique talks about how her mother, in particular, was very aggressive um, about stressing the importance about getting married. And so Monique says, you know, after my bachelor's degree, my mom was like, enough is enough. When she decided to get her PhD, her mother advised her to refrain from disclosing her level of education to potential dates. She encouraged her daughter to tell the men that she worked at the college instead of saying that she was attending graduate school. Um, and Monique deduced that her mother feared that she would be out of the market, that people would rather have someone who's easier to handle. Uh, being educated meant being too smart and that you'd be able to think on your own. Um, and unfortunately for Monique, she started to feel that that in fact was coming true, right? That, that she was going into her 30s and that she was not going to be able to find a relationship or children. Um, and so she was starting to worry that, and so many of the women really worried about okay, if I get a PhD, I can't necessarily, I won't be able to get married. So this, so it was, a, it was an interesting struggle that many of the women experienced. Um, so one of the things that I think I, I found within this was the sense of Mexican feminism. And the way that I define it based on the, the stories that I heard was that, you know, you can use education to liberate yourself um, and you can access more choices but that inevitably you're still remaining within the confines of a heterosexist, male-dominated environment. Um, and so we can certainly see this as a, a negative, right? But I also want to contend that this actually was um, an asset for these women, um, and it was a way to survive. And I'll show you how, especially particularly in academia. So all of the women talked about this notion of performing. They had to perform their identities. And it often would move between uh, femininity and masculinity. And that from their perspective, the academic environment really is the acceptable forms of behavior are really masculine forms of behavior. Um, so they talked about the ways in which they perform masculinity and femininity in graduate school, as they were on the job market, um, at academic conferences. And so I'll share some stories. So Alicia, she's Mexican, middle class, physical sciences. Um, she was really acclimated to her department culture. Um, she admitted that she closed her eyes to gender in the laboratory. And she really did create a safe environment for herself. What that meant was she often wore pants right, um, to the lab, didn't wear makeup. So she was just one of the guys. Right. Um, and then her eyes were reopened when she was at an international conference and these men approached her from another country. And they were looking at me strangely, or at least I perceived it strangely because I hadn't had that kind of male attention in a while. And so she felt very uncomfortable, especially because the, mo the men posed questions to me in a very cutesy manner. And so in order to assuage their advances, she focused on discussing her research in a direct manner, and as a result, their faces changed. She no longer amused them. Um, and so it reminded her that she really was an exotic commodity um, and she was being viewed in that way despite the fact that she was a really good researcher, right? And so it was a reminder to her that she had to act a certain way, quote unquote, a certain way if I want people to take me seriously. And so, for, and so I asked the women, well, what do you all mean by a certain way? Because all of them talked about this performance and they talked about um, masculine performance, direct eye contact, from handshakes, speaking loudly, wearing pantsuits. And many of them believe that femininity's uniform was um, you know, often performed uh, using makeup, jewelry, long hair, skirts, wandering eyes, and quote unquote, glittering eyelashes, right? So from Elisa's perspective, she really felt that you have to have the visual recognition line up with who you are and what you represent. And so um, my, the way that I looked at it was that unfortunately you have to perform masculinity in academic environments as a response to the inability of men to interact in a non-sexualized manner. So, um, so that was some of the ways in which they survived. Um, in contrast to this, Yesenia, who's Chicana Mexican-American working 
class, social behavioral sciences. She described herself as low feminine. Um, and so she had to work very hard to present herself in a feminine manner to match the game that she was witnessing in the department between the heterosexual men and the women. And she would say, you know, the women faculty are really into men, like they really sit down, they pay attention to what they have to say, and I don't do that crap. I don't even do that with my own husband, she mm -hmm. says. Um, but what she was observing was that the women were doing a lot of emotional work with the male faculty um, and would often hug them at social functions. And she just did not want to participate in those kinds of performances. Um, but she did want to use femininity as a way to increase her scores in her teaching evaluations. And she wanted to um, look more feminine when she was having to approach white men uh, regarding letters of recommendation and resource allocation. So there were different ways in which they were using their femininity to try to get resources, um, and particularly in competition with, unfortunately, with white women. So Atzlan, um, who was a Chicano in the physical sciences, and I thought this was interesting that he observed this. But he observed that Mexican-American women have to worry about Latino males. And they got to worry about males per se. And then they got to worry about white women, because I'll tell you, white women do little to nothing to help the Latinas in science. And so basically, Latinas are having to contend with the men. They're having to contend and compete with white women, uh, and, and doing this in a variety of ways. Uh, when they were looking at the job market, they were advised, many of them, not to wear jewelry or perfume, to wear skirt suits. Um, they were supposed to be in dark, subdued colors. Um, so there's a lot of this you know, kind of costume, right? Um, and to be prepared for the scene by when saw sexist guys who make sexist comments and ask inappropriate questions for women. Um, so all these kind of different masculine symbols uh, were very apparent. And many of them would observe this in a variety of ways. Finally, Rachel, Mexican American or Mexican middle class social behavioral sciences, she talked a lot about male showboating that was happening at academic conferences, and that inevitably this would um, lead to um, classroom behavior as well. So she would talk about in my seminars, my Mexican American male peers who are good leftist, socialist, communist, whatever, they'll spout a million things about the mujeres zapatistas or Gloria Anzaldúa or just how they respect la mujer but they won't listen to the Mexican-American woman sitting next to them. How can they value a woman in the abstract, but not shut up and listen to what she has to say when she's sitting right next to them? So these are the challenges that many of the women in my study were experiencing. Um, and certainly they were experiencing challenges with their family and the types of consejos that they were receiving. They were also having to try to navigate these hostile environments. Um, but, but what I think we have to think about is, so much of their lived experience was really helped to inform how they were surviving at the team. Um, that doesn't mean that we need to not do something about it. And so I have some questions, um, and so we can get into some discussion. But you know, some things that I thought about with this work is how do we, as an institution, you know, take some responsibility to help prepare Latinas for life during college, um, especially as they're navigating multiple worlds. Um, and also graduate school, and what that means for them when they're having to explain to their families that they're not necessarily postponing children, right? How do we empower Latinas as they na navigate and negotiate through these male-dominated spaces? Um, what types of policies and practices can we enact so that we can support both Latinos and Latinas in their success? Um, and then how do we help them navigate um, their educational aspirations with, with their family um, and the challenges that they may experience? So those are some of the questions that I have. And certainly we can open it up to any of your experiences. And then I'll just I'll just leave you with this one consejo from Rhonda, um, who just wants to share this with those who are aspiring into graduate school and have been in graduate school. Um, just about not giving up and that you have to be crazy, and that's OK, um, to dare to survive and to, to face that despair and dare to face that pain, and it's going to enrich your life. So that's kind of her example for all of you. So, thank you. So let's open up the floor for comments or questions. Or if anything like resonated with you all too in your own experiences. Mm -hmm. 
Um, being that you're in this area and it's not dominantly Mexican American at all, um, do you ever plan to change your field work more focused on other nationalities of Latinos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly something for me, you know, this is, a lot of this is based on my institution work, right, and, and about just trying to uncover my own experience as a Chicana <coughs> growing up and in, in going to higher ed. Um, but I also recognize that the reality is that where we live in the mid-Atlantic is, is going to have a lot of South American, Central American communities. And so, and I think one of the things I'm trying to do is learn more about the community rather than assuming that they're going to be similar to the Mexican Americans that I experience out west, right, um, or even in Georgia. So, so that's part of like trying to understand um, immigration history, understanding um, how Latinos came to this area, um, and the specific challenges that they, they face. And so, certainly, that is of interest to me. I mean, a lot of those quotes resonated with me. I mean, they, they seemed very, sort of in a way, unsurprising. Mm -hmm. right. um, which I guess is good. <laughs> but um, so I wondered, you know, um, what part of this is specific to sort of Latina women? So if, or even to academia. So I wondered if you, you know, for example, if you looked at Latina women in corporations, mm -hmm. you know, how would, how would, their experience in academia compared to their experience in other kinds of workplaces, and then um, how would their the experience of Latinas compare to say you know the experience of say African American women or even just women faculty members in general in general I mean if you I don't know if you you've done reading that sort of on some of those comparative. Um, I haven't had a chance to, but I can see, you know, because I think for me, it's much more about just how people navigate hostile environments, and that could be, the context could be education, it could be the business world, right, it could be, um, it could be government. So, um, so certainly I know that there is work that has been done to, to look at those experiences, um, but it isn't something that I have necessarily uh, done a lot of studying about, right. And I think it is, it is interesting because there is a challenge, I think, when we try to group women of color together because their lived experiences are different and their histories are different of how they even are here in the U.S., right? So we have voluntary and involuntary immigrants. Um, and so a lot of those experiences, you know, will dictate, and, and some of them are, are shared, um, certainly. But but I think it is difficult, right, to, to blend it all together to say all women of color experience this. And so, I, don't, I think I think we have to add continue to add more complexity to this issue. I think what's often difficult for me, um, and often people even in qu quantitative work, will say, well, did you compare them to white people? What either you know, and often that to me says, you know, are we trying to create a standard, right, where whites are the standard, and that we're trying to c contrast that experience? And so, so that's also a challenge too, to just say, well, these are their experiences, and then we need to figure out how to support them and then look at, you know, drawing connections across communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is really powerful research and um, the idea of putting the expectation of racism at the center of what it is that we're studying and what you just said, um, the study of how people navigate hostile environments is something that I think is really important. I'm right now teaching a class on language and racism, and one of the things that we're talking about is very similar to the kinds of things that your informants talk to you about in their narratives. And so I think the idea of taking those ideas and putting them at the center of a higher ed research agenda is itself a very political mm -hmm. act. So I'm curious, what kinds of response have you gotten as you give talks like this, and maybe in, you know, not the Latin American Studies Center, but perhaps um, audiences that might be responsible in ways for some of that hostility that, that your interviewees are talking about in the first place? It's been interesting because my, um Experiences in Georgia in particular, when any time I was talking about race and racism, um, I would often get 
a, a smiling face back. It was never a um, real confrontation of, about these issues. Um, and particularly because I, you know, I'm still studying the, um, the ban against um, students without documentation in Georgia. They're banned from five selective institutions in the state from being able to apply, and uh, including the flagship. And so, um, so I've been studying kind of the faculty responses to that and the creation of Freedom University, which is specifically for students without documentation. Um, and it's a zone's counter space. Um, so I, I talk to people about this, and they just they just smile and look at me. And I, so I haven't had like a necessarily a direct confrontation about it or a challenge to this. Um, and also, I think you know where I'm I'm fielding this um, are in safer spaces. So you know my educational conferences um, tend to be uh, social justice focused, and so so it, it's been interesting because I, I haven't necessarily had pushback about it, but I also have observed people not really responding to my work right? and just kind of not even engaging. Or what about in peer review? You know where people are anonymous. Um, I've been told that some of the work is too emotional. Um, I've also been critiqued for the number of participants that I have in my study. Right? So, um, so that's often, that's much more of how it's coded rather than someone saying that they won't publish my work. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciated the the findings of performance as survival. And I was wondering, um, in regards to that topic, did you happen to find where it was or who it was with that these women felt as though they could be comfortable um, speaking about who they are and really letting go of having to put on a performance, put on a mask of who they are? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think many of them relied on other faculty of color, women of color, if they could find them, right? Because um, only ones. Um, in their program, and so the woman that I was describing, Nisenia, who was low feminine, she was also she was always encouraged by her um, colleagues, um, and they were often Latina colleagues um, that she was able to find in where she was located. So, um, but I think unfortunately many of them had to, you know, they, they I don't think for some of them they even recognized that they were doing this um, until I asked them. Um, and and so I mean I think that that's part of the process too is that uncovering the ways in which we perform we perform in general right I mean I think that that's a lot of the work that Judith Butler talks about um, in, in looking at gender as performance and so how do we perform our identities we do that all the time um, in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. um, something that I found that was kind of interesting is. Uh, during Valentine's Day, I was speaking with my dad, and I just like made an off offhand joke. I was like, "Oh, I'm like never gonna get a Valentine, whatever." Not really upset about it. He was like, "Well, I think guys find you intimidating." He said, like, "Can you pare that down a little bit, like, be more specific?" Um, I'm the firstborn, and I'm exactly like my dad. And he was always the one that was, "Oh, and I'm Egyptian. That makes a big difference." Mm -hmm. um, he was always asking, like, the one to push me to like go to school. He let me apply to like ten undergraduate schools. Like, don't even look the application fee, like be a doctor, be a lawyer, be whatever you want to be. So I kind of um, just kind of felt resistance. I was like, well, you kind of told me my whole life to do what I want, but I have to cut it down when it comes to like social life. I, I don't think that, um, I don't think, I didn't expect a comment from from my dad like that, I mean, if he was pushing me to um, gain education all the time. So I just kind of thought that was, we're not done with the conversation. Like I'm still right. kind of turning it over <laughs> to my mind. Right. But why, um, why do you kind of have to tone down your education of all things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I think that, you know, it, it is interesting because I think it comes to a, a, a point that families begin to rest back on their traditional cultural values, right? And so at some point it, they'd say, well, this is good, but no, no, our, our child is now in her mid-20s, our child is in her 30s, or, you know, like, who's going to take care of her? So sometimes it ends up reverting back. Um, and you know, and I think to myself, you know, I think it'd be really wonderful as just kind of a practical approach, is if there could be women of color support groups on a campus um, where women could get together. Because I think that even culturally, you know, even if the cultures are different, there's still some connections that can be made. And so, how can we help 
women to talk through some of these things, um, especially if they may be the first in their families to go to college, or their families aren't really don't really understand kind of what college experience is like, even if they went to it 20 years ago. I mean, so so how do we help women navigate and feel empowered? And what kinds of scripts would we use to talk talk back to our families, yeah. right? Yeah, within a sense of respect and trying to adhere to cultural norms. Right? So, yeah. mm-hmm. um, thank you so much for, for your talk. I have a question about, um, at the institutional level, a, a, a lot of stories balance between, you know, confidence at work, but also with the, with the family. Talking about the institutional level, what can institutions really do better on, on their end? You know, we can't change families, but to have, you know, Latino women not drop out of such high drinking rates or, or feel they belong, um, and maybe even get the skills to, um, to deal with kind of individual with their own problems. You're talking about uh, support networks. Um, any other things or any other things that you see universities do that have been particularly effective at changing uh, dropout rates or or, um, or that you've heard been particularly successful? Well, in higher education, there's um, a lot of literature that looks at college choice. And there's this the entire model that look at the college choice process. And it's very individualized. So it's you, the student, are making a choice about going to college. And, and unfortunately, that's not the case, right? That it isn't just about you, it's about your whole family and the implications of, of going to college and how that's going to affect your family unit. And so I, I don't think that we spend enough time doing outreach. We expect students to come here to our campus. We expect students to be the ones to initiate conversations with faculty. Um, and, and so I mean, so that's one of, the, one of those aspects, right? Um, that, that we aren't necessarily having conversations with parents and families and siblings and, and bringing the whole family to campus and encouraging you know, that because they're making decisions as a unit. It isn't just about the individual. Um, and then how do we continue to retain families as their child is going through college? Um, and so you know, what um, is often depicted as helicopter parents um, where parents are hovering over their children um, really, I think we need to think about, well, it isn't just about like breaking that bond, right? But how do we use that bond to help a child continue to develop into an adult, um, but also develop interdependence with their families? Because I, I don't necessarily, I'm not of the mind necessarily that a, a college student needs to be a, absolutely break away from their families, right? So, so how do we help them to negotiate some of that? And some of that is incorporating family into Institution, institutional events and activities and fostering that um, to make it feel more welcoming for families to feel like they're a part of this, not just their student. But also I think, you know, it's also about asking the women, right? Context is important. So what is good for women on a particular campus is not going to be the same on a different campus. So what are the ways that we can address the needs that the women presently have in this context? Um, to support them. So certainly it's asking them to, they have knowledge about what they need, right? So so what can we do to enhance that for them? In any of this, um, people you interviewed, did you find there became like hostility within the family? Because I know me going to graduate school, like now my dad's had a family, I'm the first one to go to college. And if I say to them, like, oh, well, now you're just trying to act smart and be smarter than us. Like, you see that happen a lot? Because I get that all the time with my family. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Yesenia was one of the most vocal ones. And I'll have mm-hmm. to look back through some of the, the uh, narratives. But um, she chose to go to graduate school after she got married. And she received a lot of resistance from her mother-in-law, who's, who was believing it, you know, was saying, you're not being a dutiful daughter-in-law. And you're taking my son away from me. Because she had, they had to move away from California um, for her to go to graduate school, and so you're taking my son, and then then you're taking my grandson away from me. So so certainly there was a great deal of hostility. So not all the women were supported, right, in continuing with their education. Um, you know, and I think I, I think that it is difficult, and I think it's something that we have to talk about. I think even in college that you really it's difficult to go back home again. That you will never really go back home. Because because there is a um, you've been exposed to different um, 
environments now in college, and so and you're learning different things and you're using different language, right? Um, and so inevitably that's going to create some tension in the family. Yeah, my family often calls me the militant. I, the militant. Yeah, right? I get the same but, thing. but then, like, I got a call today to ask, you know, to figure out how to read a document, right? So, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to, I mean, the personal experience. I mean, my mother also was very much encouraging me, precisely for this reason, you have to have your own money, you can't be dependent on a man, and... You know, she she has a constant comment. My sister, who's a uh, who's a doctor, she's an MD, but she feels that my sister is like too subordinate to her husband, whereas I'm better because I stand up to him more. So there's a running kind of commentary about, which I think my grandmother also had, right? About, um, and at the same time, she'll say, "I'm Clemente. Like I've always been Clemente. I never bow to authority," which is you know said in sort of like I'm you know this like a. <laughs> Yeah. Problematic, you know, kind of. Yeah, it's it's really. I don't. I mean, I, I certainly I think I have to continue to read more and think about this more. But but it is interesting about these kind of these different scripts that mm -hmm. we're constantly having to like siphon through to figure out. It's almost like a sieve, you know, mm -hmm. and and trying to figure out like, are you are you saying this out of pride? <laughs> are you saying this out of like an accusation? Like. What is this about, right? Um, well, I think there's an ambivalence. And even for us, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I always tell this story that when I got my first job, I went shopping with a friend and I bought, you know, clothing, like, talking about the performative aspect, my professor clothing. And when I moved, I actually left it in the closet. I left it. You know, so I mean, there's a way in which I think you know, you know, sometimes we're not fully prepared or not, or you know, we feel an ambivalence about the that performing that role. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But there's something about the term rebel because I think I've gotten accused of that in my family too, and that's always kind of a shock. You know, um, that could be an interesting thing, maybe in the data that you already have to see. Um, because it seems like that could be one of those moments of studying gender and advancement cross-culturally that mm -hmm. might be really productive. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you is how, I mean, what age, what was the age range of the women you interviewed question. and how many of them were married versus unmarried, how many had children or not? Mm -hmm. um, at the time of the study, so I interviewed them about five years ago, um, and so, goodness, let me think. Um, I'm gonna, s at least a third of them were married at this point, um, and were either starting to have kids um, or have been talking about having kids. Um, and many of the, uh, the oldest one was in her. I mean, they were they were all pretty much kind of at entry level positions. And what I would love to do um, with my work is to um, to follow them to, and start to interview them again. Um, and especially now that many of them I know, like because we've become Facebook friends, it's just it's, it's been interesting the how my relationship with my participants has has evolved. Um, but I know many of them, and so many of them are starting to have kids and uh, get into some type of partnered relationship. I think one of the challenges within my study, and it's something that I talk about in my actual dissertation, is the ways in which I reproduce some of this heteronormative, um, quite even questioning. I, I never questioned people's sexual orientation. I didn't ask about that. And I think only one person uh, came out to me during that interview. But it, it occurred to me, I was like, oh my gosh, I did not ask this of any, anyone else. Um, and so I know at least one identified as lesbian, but I, I cannot say what the others may have identified as. So note to self. <laughs> it's interesting to see that there are some connections that we can make. And I hadn't thought about it doing it cross-culturally, but you all give me an idea. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much, and certainly we can keep, you know, having a conversation, but I really appreciate this opportunity to share my work, and thanks for being here. Right. <laughs> thank you.